What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Fireside Giants. I'm your host, Anthony Rivardo, joined by my co-host, Alex Wilson. And yesterday, we broke down the New York Giants' fifth-round draft pick, Tyrone Tracy Jr., out of Purdue, running back prospect that we're pretty excited about. But now we want to go back into the fourth round of the draft and discuss Theo Johnson, another player who we really like and think that Joe Shane might have uncovered a gem here. I'm pretty high on Theo Johnson. I thought that he was one of the more intriguing tight end prospects coming out of the draft and the New York Giants landed him in round four. Feels like really good value, especially considering the Darren Waller situation. Darren Waller likely to retire, not going to be with the team in 2024. Theo Johnson could potentially be in line for a starting job this upcoming season and could play a very large role and make a massive impact on the team as a rookie, potentially. And we're going to go ahead and break down why we think that could be the case and kind of just give you a reaction to the Theo Johnson pick and give you all of the ins and outs of what makes him such an intriguing prospect. But before we dive into all that, make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode and comment your thoughts down below in the comment section. If you listen to Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. Go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. Without further ado, Alex, how are you doing today, my friend? And what are your thoughts on the Theo Johnson draft pick? I'm doing pretty good. And look, Theo Johnson is a really interesting prospect. I know somebody in our comments section yesterday after talking about Tyrone Tracy said, well, I thought you guys would make a video about Theo. And I was like, well, it's coming. We talked about it today. Um, And listen, the Giants not knowing what the future holds for Darren Waller, I think we can all come to the conclusion he's likely going to retire, probably call it like an 80-20 split right now. Um, It seems like it's trending in that direction, obviously respecting his privacy as they go through um, that divorce. But, you know, when it comes to the Giants moving forward, <clears throat> finding a good pass-catching tight end obviously is imperative to the overall strategy. All good teams in the NFL these days have a tight end they can rely on, whether it be Travis Kelsey or Mark Andrews um, or George Kittle or Sam Laporta. You know, every great team um, has that tight end that they can utilize. Kyle Pitts obviously very underutilized with the Falcons primarily why their offense has been garbage, um, not to mention really bad quarterback play. So <clears throat> looking at what the Giants are trying to do, Daniel Bellinger, pri- primarily a blocker, but has some uh, skills as a kind of security blanket. He can be that like short uh, range kind of guy. But then you have Theo Johnson, who's a six foot six maestro in a lot of ways. There's a lot of room to grow here. I'm not going to sit here and, and act like he's a perfect prospect because he certainly isn't. Um, but at six foot six and what, 259, the dude is massive and he runs ridiculously well. So, Anthony, I'll let you kind of talk about his athletic profile because I know that's something that you're passionate about when, you, when we're talking about how what his upside really is. So, give me some insight into what you're thinking there. Yeah, I mean, the athletic profile for Theo Johnson is just about perfect if you're trying to replace Darren Waller with a Darren Waller-like character. Theo Johnson is 6'6", 259 pounds, which is about the same height and weight as Darren Waller. But on top of that, he ran a 4'5", 40-yard dash, which is one of the fastest ever recorded at the scouting combine among all tight ends. He also had really good metrics on some of the other drills, like the 39.5-inch vertical jump. Guy can go up there and get it. 10'5-inch broad jump, super explosive player, and also the 4 419 seconds shuttle time, which again shows very good agility. So not only is he a fast straight line runner, not only is he big and strong, but he is agile. And that's one of the things that translates into his game. When you watch some Theo Johnson film, you'll see a pretty good route runner, somebody who does kind of explode out of his breaks, make quick cuts. And if you go ahead and you read some of the scouting profiles, you want to look at Lance's airlines on NFL.com or the one on the draft network. Both of those uh, scouting profiles praise his agility in and out of breaks and his ability to run routes. So where you kind of just mentioned there, Alex Daniel Bellinger, a very good blocker and somebody who's had success as an underneath pass catcher, you know, kind of that security blanket role. Different type of player here in Theo Johnson because he's not your sit underneath into a zone and just make some easy possession possession catches for you. This is a guy who can get vertical. He can be your seam buster. You know, go up the seam against a cover three and make a clutch reception down the middle of the field. That's what you're looking for in a Darren Waller. That's what you're getting, hopefully, in a Theo Johnson if he's able to develop and play well at the NFL level. But on top of that, not only is he a good vertical threat, he has some pretty solid blocking traits. If you go through his film, he can lay the wood. He has a few pancakes on his film that are really exciting, but also he's pretty technically sound as a blocker. Does he miss some blocks? Yes, absolutely. You know, he is a tight end, not an offensive lineman at the end of the day. But of tight ends who can block, 
He's pretty solid, and I think that there's a lot to do uh, that you can do with Theo Johnson in your lineup. I don't think that you handicap your lineup in any way or your offensive game plan because he's not strong enough as a receiver or not strong enough as a blocker. He's pretty good at both, which means you can keep him on the field as your starting tight end for the majority of your snaps. So I don't know what his ceiling is going to be. I don't know how good he's going to be at the next level. Again, we're talking projections here with a rookie. But just in terms of his ability to do more than one thing on the football field, remember Brian Dable always says smart, tough, dependable, and also you could throw in there versatile. He and Joe Shane really, uh, really emphasize versatility. Theo Johnson having that ability to play as a pass catcher, but also having a solid base in his blocking abilities, again, makes him dependable, makes him a player that you can keep on the field and play in multiple roles. So Alex, when you kind of hear that and you look at some Theo Johnson clips or highlights or film, however you've kind of broke it down Theo Johnson so far, what's really stood out to you? Because again, to me, I think it's his ability to get vertical down the field, make some plays and also run some pretty decent routes for a six foot six, 259 pound tight end. I mean, look, you're not going to find many players like this. The best um, kind of, you know, I, I was trying to think of a pro comp for him, and the guy that keeps popping into my head is Jimmy Graham. Um, why do I say Jimmy Graham? Well, Jimmy Graham isn't like the best route runner ever, but he is a he's a basketball player. You know what I mean? He's like he's like having like Anthony Davis, maybe a little, maybe better than Anthony, <laughs> not Anthony Davis. He screws your parlays. Um, maybe it's like having like LeBron James playing tight end, right? Like that's kind of what you look for in a guy, Phil Johnson. Like he can go up, get the ball has solid hands, you know, he is a contested catch guy with that frame, he can beat man coverage, he's not gonna, like, blow you out of the water when it comes to after the catch, because he's not, like, the, f I mean, he's fast, um, but I am curious to see how he fares at the NFL level in terms of breaking tackles, whatnot, um, but he is going to dominate those contested catches, he's gonna beat you in man coverage off the bat, especially if he is up against linebackers, but my most, in my most intriguing um, kind of category and variable when it comes to Theo Johnson is his red zone qualities. Now, he had seven touchdowns last year um, for Penn State, and, you know, he had only had 45 targets, 34 catches, and seven of them were touchdowns. I mean, that's kind of, remember when we, like, when we got, like, uh, what was his name, uh, Toy Lolo a couple years back, or even Kyle Rudolph. We wanted Kyle Rudolph to be the red zone guy, the guy that was going to go and, like, haul in 10-plus touchdowns a season, and he obviously was now. He got him up coming off Liz Frank injury on his foot, and he never was the same. He ended up leaving that year after that, or whatever, two years after that. So, you know, looking at Theo Johnson, I think the Giants, their red zone offense is horrible. I mean, I know the conversion rate was really decent in 2022, but they were never getting there, right? Like, if you get there 10 times and you convert for uh, six or seven times, that's great. But the, but the Kansas City Chiefs got there 50 times. So even if your conversion rate is fifty is 20% lower, but you're getting to the red zone 100 times more, you're scoring more touchdowns. So the math, that's kind of what it, what it would say. Um, the Giants last year did not get to the red zone enough. In 2022, they didn't even they didn't get there enough. The conversion rate was good. They just didn't get there enough. So... Guys like this are going to help you move the chains. They're going to help you pick up first downs on short yardage situations. Um, and most of all, they're going to help you score touchdowns and, and you know boost that conversion rate. So, Anthony, you know, when you look at him, how do you think the Giants implement him in the red zone? Well, I think that one of the things you can look for in the red zone with Theo Johnson is an ability to kind of do some catch and runs, right? And so I'm not talking goal line because a lot of people will point to a six foot six, two hundred fifty nine pound guy and say, okay, in the red zone, you want him on the goal line, you're gonna throw fade routes to him, but. You're not really going to do that in the modern NFL. The conversion rate for fades, goal line fades, is very low. A lot of teams don't do that. But if you look at the way, I'll use the Kansas City Chiefs because they are the gold example. You know, not everybody's going to have a Travis Kelsey and be able to do Travis Kelsey things, but everybody wants to emulate certain aspects of that. Travis Kelsey isn't just going up there catching fade routes. Instead, he's using his athleticism on drag routes, slide routes, all those short routes, flat routes even. You just get him the ball in space, and because he's big and he's fast, he's able to find his way into the end zone that's more so what you can expect with a guy like a Theo Johnson just trying to get him the ball in space and let his athleticism do the rest of the work and if you do take a look at his receiving depth throughout his career uh, on PFF maybe or elsewhere you'll see um, the overwhelming majority of his targets like most tight ends is in the short to intermediate range zero to nine yards but he actually has a good bit from 10 to 19 yards at 22 percent of his targets last season that's pretty high for a tight end. I mean, if you want to go through a lot of the tight ends in the NFL, you'll see 60 to 70% short, 57 and then 22% medium with 11% on 20 plus yard uh, targets. 
but it's a pretty nice target share there. And, and you'll see a lot of the times they do send him vertical up the seam. They'll send him on wheel routes down the sideline. I really do like the way that Theo Johnson uh, has a diverse route tree is what I guess I would call it. And, you know, I think that they could have gotten him more involved at Penn State in the red zone and used his big body a little bit more. But the ways that they did use him were pretty encouraging. And you could definitely see a role for him in the red zone, whether you're talking through his size or through his speed. So uh, I guess that kind of answers your question there. I, I think that a lot of what you're going to see from, from this guy in the red zone, here's actually the one play that I'll bring up as an example for what I'm trying to articulate. Last year, Darren Waller had one touchdown. It was a red zone touchdown, but it wasn't some fade route. You know, it wasn't like he was on the outside and they threw a jump ball to him. He used his speed and athleticism to get vertical up the seam and then caught it between two defenders in the end zone. That's what you can expect from Theo Johnson. Getting up the seam, getting in between two defenders, catching it in the end zone, using his speed and athleticism to get to the right spot at the right time, timing throws from the quarterback. So that's what I envision for Theo Johnson again. A lot of what I see from him, I see in the way that the Giants wanted to use Darren Waller. It's just the fact is, Darren Waller was barely on the field last year and probably won't be on the football field for any team in 2024. So, what you want from this from this player, if you're the New York Giants, do the things that we wanted Darren Waller to do. You don't have to do them at the same level as Darren Waller because Darren Waller is a you know NFL veteran. But do the things that we asked of Darren Waller, but actually be on the field to do those things. If Theo Johnson stays healthy, he will play a lot because he has that playing style similar to Darren Waller, therefore allowing the Giants to run the playbook the way they want to run it and opening things up. Because oftentimes last year, the Giants had trouble getting the ball to some of their playmakers and getting guys like Slayton and Wandale and even Saquon open or getting the ball in their hands because they didn't have anybody impacting the middle of the field. Waller wasn't on the field for a lot of those games. When he was on the field, you saw pretty big performances from other guys. How about against Washington when Jalen Hyatt had that deep reception thrown by Tyrod Taylor? Well, if you watch that play, safety was sucked into the middle of the play into the middle of the field playing cover three. That's because Darren Waller was on the field, and you can't just let Darren Waller run up the middle of the field with nobody guarding him over the top. So now that you have a guy like Theo Johnson who can consistently be in the lineup vertically stretching out the field, you might open up more opportunities on the outside for not only Hyatt, but now Malik Neighbors as well, who defenses have to account for. So the, dy the dynamic ability of Theo Johnson to just get vertical up the field and use his 6'6 body and his 4'5 speed... It's going to pull things into the middle of the field. It's going to open things up on the outside of the field. And therefore, you're going to get some big explosive plays downfield, hopefully, as long as the quarterback can deliver them to Jalen Hyatt, Malik Neighbors, and the rest of them. So I, I know I kind of started with the red zone discussion there, and then I went into a more deep down the field discussion there. But again, I just see a lot of his work being done, not only in the short middle of the field, but deep middle of the field. And even if you're not talking about throwing the, him the ball over the deep middle, it's just the fact that Theo Johnson is fast enough and large enough to run down the middle of the field and take up space and suck in those safeties. That'll open things up on the boundaries for other guys and create one-on-one -on -one opportunities for some of those wide receivers, like I mentioned. So there's a more complete answer to the red zone and other areas of the field, Alex. But I imagine you see the same things as me where Johnson's vertical ability should open things up for some other playmakers as well. I mean, it has to. It, look, I, I, and I'm going to preface this by saying, um, you know, when you actually look at how how the Giants are going to probably go about this situation in terms of, I don't think Theo Johnson is going to be an instant impact player in, in, in the sense that they're going to walk out day one and he's going to be like part of the significant overarching game plan. I think this is a player that does need development. I think this is a player that does have a tremendous amount of upside. But he's got to work his way into this equation. And the way he does that is by when he gets his number called, he makes plays. You know what I mean? Um, how often do we see guys, like when your number is called, when those plays are drawn up for you, when you got to make a play and they fail to do so, you quickly lose the trust of the quarterback. You quickly lose the trust of the head coach um, and the play caller. So if a guy like Field Johnson can come in, you know, operate in line, operate out of the slot, kind of a jumbo option, um, you know, this is someone who I could see making a really big impact. And I and I know you did not like this comp that I kind of threw out the other day because um, he's not that good. But we're also talking about, you know, Theo Johnson's mid-round pick. So I don't expect him to be Mark Andrews or whatever it might be. The comp I had for him was like Mike Gusecki because I do think that both those guys are freak athletes in, in the sense that they're like good receivers. Um, I do think that Theo Johnson's ceiling is higher because he has the better capacity to block. So I think that if he could have Gusecki's uh, receiving qualities, and by the way, those are very 
decent qualities. Like, he's a good receiving tight end. But he adds the blocking element to it. He's going to be a starter in this league, right? He's going to be a starting caliber tight end. Um, <clears throat> so with that being said, I am excited to see how the Giants implement him in this system. Um, I see him being more of this linebacker. But he, I, I see him featuring more against defenses that run heavy man coverage. You know, like a Wayne Kamarindale defense. I think that that's where he's going to excel. Like against defenses that love to man up, love to have linebackers. Like go, give us your 6-2 linebacker against our 6-6 tight end. As long as Daniel Jones can throw that thing within his catch radius, it's going to be completed. You know what I mean? Like you're going to, or it's going to be a, it's going to be a penalty. So um, I do love that size advantage that he has and that power concept. And it, <clears throat> sometimes one of, one of the cons that you'll see on like the draft, on his draft profile on NFL.com from Lance Zierlein is like, sometimes he doesn't play like, with, to his frame in terms of blocking like he doesn't use his frame enough he doesn't like use that power if he refines those fundamentals and just gets dirty in the trenches he's gonna be a good blocker he just doesn't like go 100 percent with his with his power with his strength sometimes and that's easily fixed you know what i mean that's an, that's kind of just like teaching him where to be how to use his leverage how to use his lower body and upper body like how to use his frame to his advantage um and every like you know tight ends are so focused these days on being just tremendous receivers. Like, think about all the great tight ends coming into the league, like Sam Laporte, like all these guys. Kyle Pitts, they're all, like, amazing receivers. All, all, usually, they're a little bit underwhelming blockers. Brock Bowers is the perfect example. Elite receiver, a little bit small, but he's a 100% max effort guy, so you love him for that. Um, same with Theo Johnson, like, really solid receiver, underwhelming blocker at times. I think that's a portion of the game, though, that, like, you can develop the block blocking is a lot of times just fundamental based, like really just technique based and positioning. Um, it takes some, a lot of experience and work, but you can improve there being a great receiver. Sometimes just you, it requires tangible traits that you're born with. Like it's a gift. You know what I mean? The ability to, to create separation like that, the ability to have that speed agility at that size, you're born with that talent. You know, you don't develop that talent. So I think Theo Johnson checks the box of he has the, um, like God given gift of being a good receiver and he has the qualities to be, but he hasn't fully rounded out his game because he's a little bit of an under underwhelming blocker at times, but that's a portion of his game. I think he will improve upon and could become a starter on this team. So, you know, do you, do you think that we'll see a lot of two tight end sets next year? Do you think that, you know, Theo Johnson could have an opportunity to really compete for the starting job with Bellinger? I don't see why he wouldn't. Honestly, I like Bellinger, but I see this as an open competition for now. It's definitely an open competition, and I wanted to pull this up. But once you asked that question, it, it reminded me of something from the draft network that I saw in one of Theo Johnson's uh, scouting profiles. Uh, what they wrote in their first opening blurb was, Theo Johnson can align both in line at the Y and flexed in space as the F, can operate as headliner or second fiddle in multi-tight end 12 personnel sets. And basically goes on to say, his run blocking is adequate, his ability to flex as a weapon into the slot and also play in line. You're going to see him in the NFL level basically play a lot in 12 personnel with another tight end on the field alongside him. So kind of to build off of your question and answer it, yes, I think we're going to see a lot of 12 personnel. I think we will see him and Bellinger both on the field. Again, assuming Darren Waller, the rest of this conversation, we're just assuming Darren Waller is not going to be here this season. I do think he's going to retire based on what we've heard from different reporters. But his ability to flex into space, as mentioned in this draft profile article, and also to play in line, that is going to open up an opportunity, many opportunities for the Giants to have both him and Daniel Bellinger on the field. Last season, I was disappointed with the usage of Daniel Bellinger, although I understood why he was used the way that he was. He pretty much just became an extra offensive tackle, chipping defensive ends and helping the tackle because the Giants' offensive line was so bad. And I think you're going to see a lot of blocking still from Daniel Bellinger going forward. But now that they have a, re a receiving tight end who can play alongside him, maybe you see a lot of 12 personnel and your offensive lineup looks something like Bellinger and Johnson on the field, plus neighbors, and I guess Juan Dale on the field as well. Therefore, or in that in that alignment, I guess you've got obviously a vertical threat and an absolute every level receiver in Malik Neighbors. But then you also have a vertical threat in Theo Johnson. Then you have two underneath options and someone who could do 10 to 20 yards and Wandale Robinson, Daniel Bellinger being the underneath guy. I think that's a pretty nice balance of receiving options in every level of the field when you align things that way. And then again, like I said, 
the Giants still are probably going to have not a great offensive line this year. So you do need Bellinger to be able to go out there and continue to chip defensive ends and help in pass protection. Meanwhile, you want Theo Johnson to be a receiving threat for you. So you can go into a lot of 12 personnel. And because, like I said, Theo Johnson can be flexed maybe into that slot position every now and then, play that jumbo slot for you. You move him there, you have a tight end chip in Bellinger. There you go. Both of those guys are on the field serving pretty valuable roles for your offense. And again, it's because the New York Giants offensive line, even though they tried to improve it this offseason, who knows how improved it truly will be. It might not be a good unit again this upcoming season. So you do have to prepare to have Daniel Bellinger stay back and block. Meanwhile, you do want a tight end who can receive. There you go. Now you have Theo Johnson who could be an adequate receiving tight end for you. So I like the way that the Giants kind of Adding him into the fold here. I like the way that they built out this offense this offseason. I'm expecting it to take a step forward. It needs to. It was among the worst in the NFL history last year. So hopefully this offense is a lot better in 2024. And we can see Theo Johnson maybe make some plays. But Alex, I guess to close this thing out, what are your expectations for the rookie season of Theo Johnson? Because I know that we've talked a lot about who he is as a player and how he might be used. And when we have those conversations, we are referring to long term what we envision for this guy. But as a rookie, immediately, what do you think his impact could be? I think that it could be pretty large or pretty significant, his impact, because Daniel or Darren Waller retiring should lead to a lot more playing time than expected for a fourth round rookie tight end. But really, overall, what do you think his impact is going to be? Are you expecting him to be the starter over Bellinger? Do you think that it's, you know, just, just kind of what are you envisioning rookie season impact for Theo Johnson? Um, my rookie season impact for Theo Johnson, I think he'll heavily he'll be heavily used um, on some special teams uh, deliver uh, stuff. I think he'll be a core special teamer. I think that he will be a designed red zone threat. I think they will develop some concepts for him specifically to attack the red zone. Um, I don't think he's going to be the primary tight end, but they also brought in those two other guys who have experience. I mean, to me, I mean, to be straight with you, it sounds like they're, they, they brought in two other guys who are like very mid players. This sounds like an open competition. You know what I mean? Like the, this is, there is no, if Darren Waller retires, the Giants don't have a big name tight end, right? It's Daniel Ballinger, Theo Johnson, a couple guys, I don't even remember their name, Jake Stoll and like somebody else. So it's like. This is very much a, a group of mid players um, until proven otherwise. Let these mids become <laughs> above average. Let, let them become goods, not mids. So like, I think this this will be a best man win situation, and the best man will get the most reps. Um, I think Bellinger will step up. I think Bellinger will have a pretty decent season. But I wouldn't be surprised if Theo Johnson was incorporated as a jumbo slot at times. Um, I see him getting a lot of red zone action. I see him being a core special teamer, just making contributions where he can. Um, but because I, I don't think he's going to be like a like a standout rookie, but I could see his sophomore season and, and and you know his third season becoming like really solid contributor. Um, but again, like you don't draft mid round guys to make an impact in the first year. You draft them because you see upside uh, in the long term, and I think that that's probably what they see in Theo Johnson. I agree with you. I think long term, he could be an adequate starter for this team. And I think that's something to get excited about. When you see a fourth round pick that you actually could envision into a starting role, be happy about it, Giants fans, because oftentimes the Giants have not found starters in the fourth rounds. I mean, there's been a few over the years. Darnay Holmes has played a pretty significant role for this team over the past several seasons, though you can debate how significant his impact has been. Uh, Julian Love turned into a starter, but now hopefully Theo Johnson is that next fourth round pick that actually steps in here and plays at a high level and, and you know, has an impact on this team. Again, you can see the vision, you can see the path towards the field for him and being able to play in a large role long term. But of course, the Giants have had some problems developing their draft classes in recent years. So we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. We're excited about the kid. We're hoping that it pans, that he pans out and that it, it, it works for him and he becomes a solid player at the next level. But ultimately, we will see the New York Giants make or break year for Brian Dable, Joe Shane, and Daniel Jones especially. The whole crew got to do something very nice this upcoming season or risk uh, your job security long term. So it's going to be fun breaking down this team all throughout this offseason. And of course, during the regular season, we'll be doing that every single day right here on Fireside Giants. So make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode. Comment your thoughts down below in the comment section. If you listen to Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. Go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. Without further ado, we'll catch you all in the next one. Have a good one. And let's go Giants.